Good morning. We're going to be going for a nice walk today. I had to take the Jeep here. We're about nine and a half miles off of the nearest paved road. Back here um, at the, turn this way, nice and slow. Scraggly Lake Owl's Head Lookout, or Owl's Head uh, Trail, whatever. We'll go up to the Owl's Head Lookout. So we're going to take a nice little walk this morning. It's going to be about four miles total two miles in, two miles out. Plenty of time for me to talk. <laughs> and you get to see the beautiful scenery. You just have to put up with the weird, you know, looking guy, you know, the uh, Bigfoot or whatever, Sasquatch going back through. <laughs> I've had people compare me to that. That's why I say that. There was some meme or something that somebody made the one time about Bigfoot. You know, they showed the picture of him far away and, and then uh, they zoomed in on the face and it was me. You know, and, and uh, you know, people were saying, oh, that's so mean. And I, th I thought it was funny. I was trying to find it again. Couldn't find it again. But uh, anyhow, I want to talk this morning as I'm walking along here. I wanted to talk about the subject of how the Jesus Christ can save you from organized religion. You say, oh, come on, that's such a dramatic thing. You know, that's ridiculous. Jesus Christ can save you from organized religion. You know, just let me show you this real quick here. Just the kind of idiots that are around. Look at this. A beer can stuffed on top of a tree. That's the kind of people drink alcohol out, come out to the natural area of God's creation out here, and they put their trash on top of a tree, break the top of the tree like that. That just killed the top of that tree because some moron, I'll pick that up when we come back out. Some moron, some devil out there that deserves to be in hell for all of eternity, unless they repent. But uh, I'm just gonna destroy a tree with my beer can. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> People are deserving of hell. They really are. Their damnation is just. Uh, no respect for God's creation. And of course, you know, that's not what's going to damn them to hell. Their rejection of Jesus Christ is what damns you to hell. But if you could pull that kind of stuff off, you aren't thinking about it, God or the Bible or anything else. I've been around a long time. Don't write in the comments, oh, you're so mean, you're so judgmental, and you know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyhow, you know, all this dramatic thing, you know, Jesus can save you from, from organized religion going to church and whatever else oh come on what a dramatic thing to say what a terrible thing to say about my brothers and sisters in christ in the church buildings right well let me just put a little scenario out there for you and you'll agree to this if you've ever been to a church building for a while i mean attended in terms of you know a year or more or whatever uh me personally I was raised going to church. Every time the doors were open, you know, we were the faithful, one of the faithful families. My parents both were, uh, my mother was an, a Sunday school teacher. My father was a Sunday school teacher. They would sing special music. They'd be involved in church cantatas and we would be in the children's choir. And, you know, we were fanatics. Uh, mission trips around America and uh, mission trips to Central America. So yeah, I have experienced it all my life. Well, not all my life because I finally got saved and got out of the system. But you know, here's the scenario. Uh, right now, it's Tuesday. Well, if you're a churchgoer, a church fanatic as I once was, then Tuesday, well, I have some time here where I need to be thinking about what we're going to be doing for Wednesday night prayer meeting. And uh, Wednesday night prayer meeting comes along and then it's uh, Saturday visitation or I think some people do it Thursday or something like that. But you know, you need to start thinking about visitation, going out and inviting more people to come to church. And if you do that quite frequently, then you are um, a good faithful church member, you know. Brother Brian here, he loves the Lord very much. He's a faithful member of Liberty Baptist Church. 
not telling a lie there. That used to be true. I used to go to Liberty Baptist Church and um, Cornerstone Baptist Church and Berean Bible Church and Country Chapel Baptist Church and was raised in Calvary Monument Bible Church. So I've been to quite a few different ones, Methodist churches and things. Never went to a Lutheran church or Catholic or anything like that. Uh, synonymous, basically, Lutheran and Catholic. But, um, you know, I was quite the faithful churchgoer. But, you know, you get this whole thing of uh, Saturday rolls around and, okay, we have to get ready to get to bed here. You do whatever, you know. I know a lot of families in the past, it, Saturday was bath day because Sunday was the day that you go to church. You know, and that's not an option. You know, you're going to church whether you want to or not. And every week, every week, you're just there. Oh, you know, the church, the yard needs to be mowed. Is anybody going to do this? Who is going to be able to mow the yard? And you think, well, I have to do that because nobody else is volunteering, so I feel that I'm supposed to do that. You know, and I want to make the church look good. After all, that's very important. Because if the church doesn't look good, then it won't look good to prospective new members. You know, and we need to raise money because the church needs new carpet. And we can't have people coming in here. It's embarrassing, you know, get new visitors come along and they, they walk in and the church carpet is old and stained and just doesn't look very good. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm sure if you're out there, you're nodding your head saying, yeah, I've seen the same thing, experienced similar stuff. Um, we've been through it. You know what I'm talking about. Um, it's a little muddy in through here right now. On the trail there, you can see some muddy spots. They have to kind of navigate around that. But um, what is it? It's bondage. So no, brother, it's faithful service. No, it's bondage. It's bondage. And I remember one of you wrote a comment, this was years ago, about how that the one year you gave up family time at uh, Christmas because the church building said, you know, we require you to come in and you know, we need somebody to be there to faithfully serve homeless people a meal or something at Christmas. and. And it was all about, we have to do this church service, service to the church, you know? And uh, it's, that's what organized religion is. And here's the shocker about this. What happens is you just do this thing blindly because it's the right thing to do. But then somebody challenges you uh, outside of your church building thing and they say where's this stuff at in scripture well you know and you think well that's ridiculous of course it's there in scripture how could it not be there in scripture i mean the new testament maybe they didn't have everything we have today but it's because we've gotten better i mean first century christianity was lacking in a, in a lot of different areas you know i mean they just didn't have the money for church buildings and they weren't incorporated with tax exempt status and you know they didn't wear suits and ties and they didn't you know all these other things and uh so we're better now we're smarter now than they were back then but you know um and then you the biggest thing with church building the people they'll say when they're challenged organized religion people when they're challenged it'll they'll say well do you mean to tell me all the other churches are wrong all christians that have ever met in church buildings are going to hell that's what they'll do. I've had it put on me so many times. And I say, uh, that's not what I ask. I said, where in the scriptures is your church system supported? Where does the Bible say to go to church? Where does the Bible say to put on Sunday best, to give 10% of your tithe? Where does the Bible say that you should have the church building under secular government authority? Where does it say it? Well, it doesn't, you know, specifically lay it out that way. But brother, you know, that's just the way it is. And then, you know, you get some, if you really corner them, you know, some of the Bible-believing type 
at least professing Bible believing Christians. They're not really Bible believers, but um, you get some of these guys, they'll actually be honest enough to say, okay, well, the truth is, you know, we're not actually, you know, doing it the New Testament way. Okay, we'll just be honest about that. It's not really the New Testament way, the way that we're doing it, but we can't do it that way anymore. We can't ordain elders in every city and people meet in their homes or meet out in public if they're doing an evangelistic thing. We can't do it that way, brother. You know, that was, it worked in the first century, but it doesn't work anymore because the world has changed and, you know, and we have to do it this way. And, you know, uh, hey, you know what? Maybe instead of asking so many questions, Denlinger, why aren't you winning souls, huh? You know, when's the last time you led a soul to Jesus Christ, huh? You know, we have a bus ministry. We go street preaching. We put out tracks. We're out there all the time. Uh, we get lots of people saved, all right? What are you doing, Denlinger? Huh? <laughs> uh, that's what we deal with. Um, and all I'm saying is, hey, why don't we get back to doing it the Bible way, the New Testament way? Where does the New Testament teach that, uh, you know, after the New Testament is finished, then the Lord's going to contradict the New Testament with divine tradition? And if that's what you believe, by the way, that we have new beliefs that have come along since the completion of the New Testament, then what makes you any different than a Catholic, a Roman Catholic? You know, uh, the Baptist denomination, they pride themselves on saying that they are not Protestant. We're not part of the Protestant Reformation. We were around before that. Oh, uh, well, some, you know, what would be called Anabaptists, that is true. Uh, they were around before the Protestant Reformation, just called heretical little sects or whatever else. There were people around that were before the Reformation. But modern day Baptists, the ones that go to the church buildings and wear their Sunday best and all the other stuff and soul winning and all this other, um, those people, they're Protestant. They're just as, you know, a different flavor of Protestant, be it Methodist or Lutheran or Presbyterian or whatever else. They do the same things that all those other churches do, adding to the scriptures with their traditions, the traditions of men. So, um, but the whole point is here, uh, the Bible talks about Jesus. He says about if the son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. When you get saved, one of the things that happens is the Lord Jesus Christ sets you free from the yoke of bondage that's out there in the world. He puts his yoke upon you and he says, come and serve me. But in order for him to put his yoke upon you, he has to first take off the yoke of the world, the snare of the devil. He gets you out of the snare of the devil. That's what has to happen. And so, um, and if that hasn't happened, well then it's kind of an, an issue there. But uh, the Holy Spirit, he will come and he will guide you into all truth. Now, and the Bible says, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. John 17, 17. So you can't say, I am walking in the truth, and yet uh, I'm in error. How does that work? I'm walking on a trail right now in northern Maine, but it's actually California or something. No. Uh, I'll just say it's California and pretend it's California. And no, I'm walking on a trail in northern Maine. <laughs> Showed you where it's at. Not far from uh, the... Baxter State Park, the north entrance to Baxter State Park, which begins or ends, depending on which way you're going, the Appalachian Trail, Mount Katahdin. Um, those are facts. I can't change those facts. And the fact of the matter is, brother, sister, uh, or just viewer, you might not be one of my brothers or sisters in the Lord, but the fact is, organized religion is designed to trap you. That's what it is. And if you've been around church buildings for any length of time, you know the bondage. You know the thing that there's times you don't feel like going, but you have to. You can't even think about those thoughts because it's 
somehow blasphemous and evil to think that way. And uh, once you get out of it and you miss a week or two, you know, and the church people start to call you up and, hey, what, where are you at? What's going on? Are you okay? We're worried about you. You know, and you say, well, I feel the Lord's calling me away from the church building thing and whatever. Well, who have you been listening to? You know, I hope it's not Denlinger because he's a nut. <laughs> I've had so many people tell me over the years that their hirelings uh, call me crazy and Denlinger's a heretic and whatever else. And I say, okay, have that pastor get in contact with me. Write a letter and show me from the scriptures where I'm wrong. Send it by certified mail. Send it to me so that you know I get it. I have to sign for it so you can prove that I got it. And then I will do a video. And if I don't do a video, your pastor can come out and he can say that Denlinger's a coward. And you know what? You know how many pastors have ever done that? Zero. Zero. Um, if I don't know the scriptures, if I'm such an idiot, then uh, it should be fairly easy to refute me. And yet they don't, because they know deep down the dirty little secret of seminaries in America is the fact that they are taught lies and the students raise their hand, they say, Professor so-and-so, I don't understand. Where's the sad in scripture? It's, well, how do we answer these heretics? And it's just sort of a, well, we go with tradition. You know, we're just going to do this because it pays the bills, you know? And so it's this thing of they repeat the lies and they repeat the deception because we don't know what else to do. You say, well, why don't we go back to the first century? Well, we can't really do that because it would just complicate things. It would complicate matters. Just crazy. But here's the point. When you genuinely want to be saved, when you genuinely are in a repentant state where you're saying, uh, the state of contrition, I am a sinner. Uh, I want to be saved. I need to be saved. Not just want, I need salvation. Um, and you call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. I mean, again, He provides the salvation. By grace are ye saved. Whose grace? Your grace? My grace? No. God's grace. Uh, grace that is greater than all our sin. You know, uh, trying to think of how the hymn goes. You know, um, marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt, yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Woodpecker up there, <laughs> getting his breakfast. Um, if you heard that, wasn't somebody shooting at me to try to get me to stop singing. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, it's God's grace that saves. Grace through faith, okay? We're saved by God's grace, but our faith has to be there, all right? Um, and so, got a squirrel right here. You go up in the tree. He's up there. But um, I'm gonna show you a neat lookout area up here. We're getting to the first of a few where you can look out over Scraggly Lake. Hopefully the wind noise isn't too bad. There's a little bit of a breeze right now. Feels really good here this morning. Just a beautiful look out here. I'll walk down here a little bit, a little ways, so we can see this more. And turn, and there. Beautiful lake in northern Maine. But let's continue down the trail. Um, the point I'm trying to make here is, if I can get back to this, God's grace 
is there to save. God has grace for us. And um, it's not some kind of a thing that we ourselves do. And the church building issue is, the biggest issue with the church building thing is that it's adding to the scriptures. God, like I said earlier, God did not say, well, you know, let's just start out here without church buildings and without wearing Sunday best and without giving 10% of your income and without government and corporation. And later on, we'll fix that up, you know, after the New Testament's finished. It's not supposed to be that way. We are supposed to have um, the Bible as our final authority. And these liars, I mean, again, I have a very hard time with these Baptists. And they'll say, we are Bible believers in all matters of faith and practice. Their words. That's one of their mantras that they just quoted over and over again to make you think that it's true. It's a lie. You know, even if you are saved and you're in that system, you need to stop saying that. You need to say, okay, we have to admit it. We're not really Bible believers in all matters of faith and practice. We're not. Maybe in faith in terms of we believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins, you know, the whole thing. He was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 4 talks about that. Um, we believe in the, you know, resurrection and, you know, all the different fundamentals of the faith. So you could say in faith they might kind of qualify for being Bible believers. But in practice, all matters of faith and practice, you're openly lying when you say that as an independent, independent uh, Baptist. Um, in practice, you got your practices from the Catholic Church. And that's a fact. That's not me trying to insult anybody or whatever else. It's a fact. And that system, you can look at the Catholic Church and you can say, it's a system of bondage. You know, look at that bondage that they're under. Um, yes, it is. But you're doing the same thing slightly different flavor. You don't do the transubstantiation, at least not yet. But um, there's a you know confession to a priest and whatever else. But again, I've known Baptist churches that offer counseling services. And you get, you know, I knew a pastor uh, years ago, senior pastor, and I preached in that church different times. And he was telling me about how that he offers counseling services. And he said the kind of stuff that he has to deal with is horrible sometimes. People coming in and telling them about their, you know, the marriage bed and what goes on there and whatever. And he's, okay, I really don't want to know about this. And oh, But you're counseling. You're, we need your counseling services, Pastor. It's not supposed to be that way. But you see, that's what you get into when you get into the church building thing. You have to offer services to the people that come there. Marriage counseling is one of those services. And he had a uh, one million dollar insurance policy on him in case he gave the wrong kind of advice or something chapter and verse on that one please so um, Jesus Christ can save you from the system I'm going to keep saying that throughout this because that's the subject of this video um, you are in a system of bondage you are in something that uh I'm not going to be so narrow-minded that I would say that you can't get saved. You know, in a system like that, salvation is through Jesus Christ. And a lot of baby Christians do some really dumb things. I did plenty of them myself. But the whole point is, you have to get to a, a, a time when you can say, you know what, I have to, if the Holy Spirit is leading me, He's going to lead me away from the traditions of men. He's going to lead me away from this bondage. And you get out, and right now, I can walk through the woods here, basically preaching a better sermon than you're going to hear in 90% of the churches out there. Uh, just anything with the name church on it. And I've told you truth that you won't hear in those buildings. And I'm walking through the woods. I don't need a multi-million dollar church building. I'm wearing an old work flannel shirt here because it's chilly in the morning. Here's down in the 50s and things when we get up. I won't be wearing this shirt later on because it's you know July 2nd, I think. Um, but I can do this stuff. And see, for me, 
another one of the big contentions I have against the church building thing is it makes a separation. You know, there are certain things that you do when you are in church and things with, that you do when you're not in, in church. Um, well, here's a shocker for you. I'm in church right now. You say, oh, nature, yes, I agree. No, that's not what I mean. I mean, I'm in the body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ. It's people. It's not a building. It's not a location. All right? And, uh, you know, something else I want to address, because I saw it in the comments, they said that Brother Brian teaches that churches should basically be a secret society. It should only welcome in Christians, never any lost people. And um, so he believes that it should be all done in secret and you could have secret meetings and whatever. Well, that's, that's twisting what I've said. Okay, again, people like to misrepresent what I say. Um, that's not what I teach. Okay, let me explain what I teach, what the New Testament, it doesn't matter what I teach, what the New Testament teaches. In the New Testament, you read through the book of Acts and you will see that Christians are meeting in private. They're meeting in homes. Um, you know, even when Jesus Christ is still on the earth, his disciples are meeting together in private. The doors are shut. They're not out there just having a public meeting in, or some building that says all are welcome. You can't do that. Um, most of Christian history has been a history of persecution of people trying to come and shut us down and put us in prison and kill us and whatever else. That's the reality of church history. And if you've been saved for a long time, you'll understand that. And um, so uh, Christians in the New Testament, they met in private. Um, they were not having open public meetings unless they had an evangelistic type of outreach like you see in Acts chapter two, where they were speaking publicly. Okay, so what the church building people do, organized religion, They'll take Acts chapter two because they see the numbers. You know, oh man, 2,000 got saved there. Ooh, ooh, think of the tithes and offering, 10% of, of the income of 2,000 people. Ooh, you know, I remember, uh, what's her name? Um, Jack Hollis' daughter, Jenny McMurtry, I think, or was it Murtry? Murphy, Murphy, yeah, Murphy. And um, she talked about, you know, that her father had 50,000 members of his church. And she said, we lived a very lavish lifestyle. She said, I mean, think about the uh, tithes and offerings for 50,000 people. Yeah. Um, of course, they're not all tithing people. I understand you have families. The children can't tithe. Although, you know, they can if they're good. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, tithe your allowance money. I used to do that. I mean, if you've done the same thing, right, in the comments down below, you know, giving 10% of your allowance as a child, putting your little coins in the offering plate as it went by, <laughs> unreal. But, um, you know, you get the tithes and offerings of a couple thousand people, and you're teaching 10% of their income. Um, that's a pretty good system of bondage that you have there as the hireling as the, you know, <clears throat> pastor. And the people get away from that and then they think, what do I do with my money now? Who do I tithe to? Oh, I don't know. I'm gonna be in trouble with the Lord because I'm not giving 10% of my tithe to a government corporation. I mean, that's what they believe. And, uh, you know, the soul winning thing is probably one of the big ones, you know, which I've talked against the thing of hyper soul winning. Let me just say, right at the very beginning of this whole thing, um, what is the whole soul winning thing? Soul winning, he that winneth souls is wise, is found in the book of Proverbs. It has absolutely nothing to do with preaching the gospel. Completely taken out of context. And another one of the lies of the Baptists, especially. Coming to another scenic thing here with the lake. I'll show you real quick. And then we'll continue. Beautiful lake out there behind me, some of the hills. But um, when God wants to save someone, um, the Calvinists, they go too far with this. They'll say, the Holy Spirit makes the appointment. 
the Holy Spirit draws somebody. Now that's true. But God gives all men everywhere a chance to repent. God isn't just trying to draw only the elect and the non-elect, he never gives them a chance or anything else. That's nonsense. It's hyper or hyper uh, Calvinism. That uh, there are people that are born as vessels of wrath and there isn't anything that they can do, which contradicts scores of other Christians where God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Um, you know, I would have gathered ye as a mother hand us her chicks under her wings and ye would not. Um, the Lord's speaking there. They had free will. They rejected Jesus Christ. It's not that God rejected them, you know, from the foundation of the world or something. And certainly the Lord knows who's going to get saved, but that doesn't mean that he created people for hell. And, you know, you start getting into trying to figure out the mind of the Lord there, which doesn't work. But um, getting back to what I was saying here, uh, salvation is the Lord will draw people. He will say, okay, I'm going to um, start to, you know, you'll hear the gospel or you'll start to see things. You know, somebody comes out here that's completely lost, an atheist that... They were born and raised atheistic. Uh, they were, their parents were too foolish to understand, you know, what real true uh, science is. Creation, science, that this is all created out here. This didn't happen as a random chance. It's too complex to just come about as a result of an accident. That's nonsense. But you know, you get somebody that's out here that believes that way. They were put through mind control growing up, that uh, there is no God and whatever else. Uh, this is all just, you know, evolution. Um, but they come out here and they just, they start to actually study. They take some time to sit down and look at the little plants and look at a bug on the tree and they look at things and they think, wow, maybe there's a creator. You know, and they start to get under conviction. The Holy Spirit at that point is starting to draw them. It's starting to put some thoughts into their mind where they're starting to think, hmm, and when the Lord has that person in that situation, he'll take a Christian and he'll say, okay, I'm going to take you, saved Christian, and I'm going to, put, I'm going to cross your path with this lost person that has questions. There'll be a co-worker, there'll be somebody you meet uh, on the bus driving someplace, on an airplane going somewhere, or, you know, stop at the gas station, get to talking, or God will set up what we call a divine appointment. Okay, um, you can see that in the book of Acts, chapter 8, with Philip in the Ethiopian eunuch. You know, the Holy Spirit literally says, go join yourself to this uh, Ethiopian eunuch. And Philip goes and he does it. That's a divine appointment, okay? Um, this whole thing of, but brother, they went, out, they went out door to door. It says it right there in the book of Acts, that they went out door to door, brother. The 20, Acts 20, 20 vision. Look it up, brother. You're, you're off on this one, brother. I, I love your ministry, but you're off on this one. No, actually, I'm not. Because if you actually study what was going on in Acts chapter 20, verse 20, when they're going door to door, that means that they are, the people have already accepted the Lord, and now they're going to teach them, to disciple them. That's what's going on. Uh, there was no, you know, they couldn't have had a bus ministry. They didn't have buses, but, you know, have a chariot ministry or something. Uh, no. They go around in the neighborhood and get the children away from their parents so you can take them to Sunday school and, you know, fear mongering them, fear monger them into saying fake prayers so that you can hopefully get the parents to come to church and get their tithe money. I mean, let's be straight about it. That's what it was. Well, bro brother, I know somebody got saved that way. Okay, then it was salvation through a mistake, so to speak. Um, it's not the New Testament way. Again, will we stick to the scriptures as our final authority. Organized religion says no. We have to add to the scriptures because the scriptures are insufficient. That's why I say Jesus Christ has to save you out of that system. And you know, and it, when you really look at it, the whole thing, the whole big picture of organized religion, you start to realize just how bad it really is and how much bondage it holds over you. You know, and there have been so many times I see somebody and I think, okay, I'm gonna to try to witness to this person. 
and and I'll pray and you know, Lord, please help me to be a good witness for this guy and I, give me a chance to preach the gospel and whatever. And I go in and it's just a big fat no as an answer. Just there isn't anything I could do. You know, I go in there, I try to talk to the guy, the phone rings, try to say, try to get it. To, and somebody comes in, customer comes in and starts the conversation. The guy's, oh, okay, you know, did you need anything else? And, and I'm thinking, you know, and I go out and I feel so defeated, you know, and, and whatever. And, oh, I didn't get a chance. Sorry, Lord, I really failed you. And, you know, and I've had to learn over the years, I didn't fail. The Lord did not have an appointment. He didn't have anything scheduled. That person is not ready for the gospel. Um, the Holy Spirit didn't tell me to do that. It was my flesh that was telling me to do that. And again, all these great soul winners that I've studied over the years, and man, they get so prideful about that. They just get, you know, oh, uh, I won 26 people to the Lord yesterday. How many did you do? You know, and I mean, <laughs> it's in my Jack Hiles Exposed videos where literally they had this women's club thing at uh, the Hiles Church out there, First Baptist Church in Hammond, Indiana. And they had women that would brag about how many they've led to the Lord. You know, and they would have people stand up and they'd say, okay, how many people, you know, did you lead to the Lord this week? And some guy stand up, I, I led six to the Lord. Okay, six, anybody, you know, I've got six, you know, and how about uh, any somebody else? I led uh, eight to the Lord. You know, you can just kind of imagine the auctioneer thing, you know, six, 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 do we hear eight, 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 do we hear nine, 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 oh, we have 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. <laughs> it's ridiculous. But see, it's bondage. That's why Jesus Christ has to save you out of that system. And you have to get away from it and you have to realize, whoa, I was actually in a mind control cult. This, I was being brainwashed to go against the scriptures. Walking around saying, we're Bible believers in all matters of faith and practice. Bible believers in all matters of faith and practice. And you just keep doing that. And you're lying. If you're going to a church building, that is not a Bible believing system. And again, I have the video, Peter Ruckman, uh, how to start a, a New Testament church or whatever it is. And he actually says, if you have a church building, as soon as you get a church building, you are anti-New Testament, not unscriptural, but rather anti-New Testament. Because once you get into organized religion, you incorporate under the secular government, you have to do what the government tells you to do. And all the other issues, you live the two lives. You know, you're not, I'm not in church right now. My church is in the town of such and such. You know, I tell people, they, I get to talking to people when I meet them and they say, what do you do for a living? I say, I'm a preacher. And they say, oh, where's your church at? <laughs> and I say, actually, I follow the scriptures and I worship at home. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> it's not, it was nice meeting you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, I think that's a strange way to do it. I follow the Bible. Um, oh, 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 okay. Uh, I can't talk. <laughs> kind of weird, isn't it? But, um, so, some noise over here. Sounds like people are building. Somebody's building the cabin along the lake or something, I guess. But, um, so, if you're Oh, and I'll say this to another one I want to say here quickly. Um, hopefully you're enjoying the walk. Um, it's kind of challenging to walk up and down hills like this and, you know, talk without panting and breathing too loudly. Uh, <laughs> but um, the pandemic thing in 2020, that woke up a lot of people to the reality of the church building system. Because, you see, they were being taught that, you know, the Lord can heal you and, and whatever. And nobody tells me what to preach in this pulpit and the whole thing. And all of a sudden, lo and behold, the uh, hireling there, their pastor, have a little blockage here on the trail. All this stuff. Uh, their pastor said... 
crawl down underneath this. Excuse me. <laughs> Pastor says, hey, you know what? We, um, uh, we have to lock down here. And, you know, we'd like to have everybody sit six feet apart. And, you know, you need to keep the mouth covered there. Unless you're singing a hymn. You can take it down when you're singing a hymn because then you don't produce disease when you sing hymns. But, you know, when you're sitting there breathing normally, then you can produce disease. So that's the, you know, I don't like it any more than you do. But, uh, amen. Praise the Lord. At least we can still worship. Yeah, amen. I remember seeing this one uh, Baptist church. Uh, I should have made a recording of it, but I didn't get a chance to. And then I can't find it again. Any of you out there can find it. I'd love to have a copy of it just to show how nuts these guys are. But there was a John Dorsey. He was in my Carnival Preachers uh, study. And he was preaching at some Baptist church. And they literally, he was preaching outdoors. And the people were all quarantining themselves inside their vehicle. And, uh, <laughs> and to say amen, you were supposed to beep your horn. I kid you not, it was insane. Ooh, this is steep. Walking on the side of the hill here. But uh, yeah, so if any of you can find that video, John Dorsey speaking in a Baptist church outdoors and they were uh, beeping their horn to amen him. <clears throat> I'd like to find that video again. It was on Facebook or something, I think some Facebook page slammed into a tree. And uh, just, I couldn't believe it, that it was that bad. But that's what you get when you depart from the scriptures. When uh, uh, you have to do whatever you are told. You forget your common sense. Um, so, <laughs> but a lot of people saw through that. A lot of people woke up at that time. And... Um, I pray that you wake up if you're still going to some church building out there. And uh, one final thing I'd like to say, because um, up here especially, I've seen a lot of old church buildings that are torn down, um, falling down, you know, and I think to myself, are we better off without the church buildings? Because at one point in time you had a lot of people they would understand the thing of going to church and they would get dressed up and, you know, they had more of a knowledge of the Bible. But the, the whole thing is, dead religion, um, it doesn't really do anything. Yeah, you might have some more righteous standards, but it's self-righteousness. It's people being taught uh, good works. People being taught to uh, fake it till they make it. Um, I mean, you saw that with the Robert Kennedy Jr. video that I put out, where he actually says about his belief in God, he believes in faking it till he makes it. And uh, he was raised Catholic, so he knows. He knows enough about Jesus, and Jesus died on the cross and everything. He knows. But uh, is it enough to save him? Get him away from his New Age beliefs? No. It isn't. Just the same thing as the people that had, uh, you know, church buildings. That's not enough to save this nation. Here's the trail going up this way, up these steps. So now it gets to the steep area. Oh. So I'm going to be panting and breathing heavily now. Thought I heard a loon there, but. A loon is a bird in northern Maine, okay? I'm not a loon. <laughs> some, to some people I am. I guess I am. But, uh, uh, the stairway up. Turn here. So you can see where I have to go. Up that way. Up those. Up through there. Rather steep. So I'll keep recording here for a little bit. But, um, for those of you who have stuck with the video, thank you. A <laughs> um, bit of a ramble here, I guess. But uh, please understand what I'm trying to say. You are, as I fall down, uh, 
the church building thing, it isn't just a matter of my opinion versus their opinion or preferences or whatever else. No, it's bondage. And you are held in that bondage and made to feel guilty if you aren't there. Made to feel guilty if you're not soul winning and giving 10% of your tithe and the people at the social club, I mean church building, they're concerned about you. And we feel that you're falling for some cultic behavior. And we're worried, we're worried. You're going to be a renegade and go out there. And I'll tell you right now, if uh, you come out and you tell the truth to the church building people, you will see them uh, completely reverse. Going from loving friend to diehard enemy. I've seen that different times. Men that I was in ministry with, men that I ate at their house, um, helped them out, did all kinds of stuff, preached in their pulpits while they were away. And um, I say, you know, Lord, lead me away from this. And just, you know, get to, okay, all right. Okay. I actually had the one, the one time, and uh, he said, so I said, uh, Lord's calling me away from here and wants me to go elsewhere. And he said, so you're leaving the faith then? <laughs> yeah, you know, I guess he thought I was going to be an atheist because I was leaving his church building. Yeah. And boy, after that, the family was nice to me, you know, and everything. The beloved brother, Brian, and I left. And I'd see them out, you know, at a grocery store or gas station or something like that after that. And I didn't even exist. I just came up through there. Whew. Good exercise. You know, they would just look the other way. <laughs> and it happened to a couple, a couple different churches. Uh, because that's what churches are. They're cults. They're cults. So, we're nearing the top now of the trail, getting to the lookout. And, uh, whew, I don't know what the elevation is right now. Higher than when I started. There, I'm very accurate. But, uh, it's getting up there pretty good. Certainly not uh, Rocky Mountains or anything like that where the air is thinner or something. Might be a little bit thinner, but not much here. But I will finish the hike with you walking along beside me. Uh, just move your legs underneath your desk there or whatever, wherever you're at. Or just stand up and, you know, walk along or something. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, and the fellowship. Again, I'll say this is another issue against the church building thing. The true fellowship of the spirit that's there. You know, it's almost as if the church service is in the way of that. If you know what I mean. You know, you want to talk with the brethren. I remember the one church went to Liberty Baptist Church and there was a bunch of good guys there and they would they wanted to go out street preaching and doing work, you know, militant type of stuff. And um, the service would get over and we'd stand around for hours afterwards talking about the things of the Lord and, and whatever. And most of the church people, as soon as the service was over and sing the last hymn and whatever, they were out the door getting in their vehicle, probably going home to watch uh, football or something. I would imagine, but uh, real fellowship among the brethren is something that you don't want to stop. Um, it's something that's enjoyable. So, and a lot of church buildings don't really allow for that. Again, I've been places where that's looked down upon. You know, you're at church right now. Get off of there, mosquito. You're a church, you know. 
you shouldn't be here too long. We're here from 9 to 12 Sunday mornings. You know. And so... <sighs> Alright. Last little bit of the climb here. And we'll be to the summit. Uh. This increases the difficulty when you're climbing a rocky surface and you can't use both your hands. Kind of makes a interesting balance type of a thing. Oh. There's a robin. Just flew away. Oh. But you can see that it's worth it when you get to the top. I better say that one more time. I said it's worth it when you get to the top. <laughs> you get to the top of what Bible-believing Christianity is, it's worth it. All right. Huh. Let's look around behind me. Do it this way. There's spider webs all over the camera. Beautiful day. Lovely day. If you can get out, do some hiking in your area, go out and give glory to God for His creation. Do it. It's important. I'll show you one other thing here. Down there, wild blueberries right there. You can see these. They're green right now. They haven't turned, but some wild northern blueberries. God's provision out here in his beautiful creation. So, all right, now I have to walk two miles back out. <laughs> uh, so hopefully you've enjoyed the video and um, I guess we'll see you in upcoming ones. Thank you very much for watching and uh, stand by the Bible and get out of organized religion. That's my recommendation.